Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Pia Sinaroy. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce actors Simone Ashley, Nicola Coughlin, and Charitha Chandran from Bridgerton Season 2. Hi! Hi! Hi. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I think it's safe to say that Bridgerton has absolutely had a chokehold on all of us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of us were watching it the weekend it came out and uh, and definitely caught up in the whole roller coaster. And it felt like so much of, of more of a roller coaster this season around. I couldn't figure out why, but um, obviously, first of all, congratulations because the season has done mega big numbers uh, for Netflix and it has brought so many new views to this. Um, so I really want to kick it off with Charitha and Simone as you two are the newcomers this season. Uh, first of all, how much of a fan were you of the series from season one or the books? And what were you most excited to get into when you both came on board? So I hadn't heard of the books, but my mum and I have been um, fans of uh, sort of Regency period dramas all our lives. Mm -hmm. Like once a month, every Sunday, we'll sit down to watch uh, the BBC Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> so um, when Bridgerton season one came out, I'd actually auditioned before the season one came out, but I knew I was going to love it. And it was even more spectacular and innovative than I had anticipated. So then to be cast, I was just so unbelievably excited. And the two things that I think were the kind of best parts of it were to get to work with the amazing cast and crew that we did. A lot of them, Nicola, correct me if I'm wrong, were the season one crew as well. Um, yeah, yeah. And then the hair, makeup, costumes, which is just <laughs> amazing. And Simone, for you? Um, so I'd obviously heard about the series um, when it first premiered, everyone was talking about it. Like you couldn't avoid it and you could see Phoebe's face everywhere and Reggae Jean Page's face <laughs> everywhere. Um, and I was working on sex education at the time. And mm -hmm. I just remember being in the car, traveling to set and everyone would be talking about it. Um, and I hadn't actually watched it before I auditioned. Um, I auditioned quite shortly after the show came out. And then obviously when I started reading the scripts, I gave the book a read and then gave the series a watch. And I'd never really seen anything like it. Um, something so diverse and so colourful um, mm -hmm. but also so it's such a twist on a tradition and a classic that is quite known to all of us right. and I think that's what made me fall in love with it immediately um, the music the the costumes um, and I I'd never really seen a show that was so um, focused on about family and all of the different families within this world um, mm -hmm. and how you immediately relate to them and feel a part of these families and root for the characters within them. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely became an immediate fan after giving it a watch. Um, and also just reading the scripts for season two and falling in love with the relationships between the different characters, um, the sisters, Edwina and Kate, and um, their mum, and then Anthony and Kate, um, yeah, I just definitely immediately felt like I was rooting for Kate particularly and what she was doing with her family and everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think the music, the music's definitely something that <laughs> elevated it all for me. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh, I couldn't get over dancing on my own, uh, yeah, dancing I on my own version. Me so too. I love that song, so like non-classical and then even more so um, when it was... Yeah. Bridgerton Bridgertonified. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so fun. Um, Nicola, I honestly have been obsessed with Penelope from like the first moments of season one. She is truly one of the most interesting characters um, because what I love about her is that she really kind of is able to um, use her, her sort of position in a room to really, you know, be able to become Lady Whistledown and I just I love that I think maybe it's like the journalist in me you know I'm like I get yeah. it I would do this same. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I I was so curious to know kind of you know obviously as we know at the end of season one we do discover that your character is Lady Whistledown so um, right off the bat with season two what were you excited to be able to do differently with your character now that at least the audience knew about this reveal? 
Well, I think with the reveal happening at the end of season one, it really gave rain for the writers to go and like have fun with her. And then also in turn for me to have fun with her. Because in season one, you see her as this shy wallflower. And at the very end, it twists and you go, hang on, it was her doing all that stuff. So the chance to play all of that and the complexities of her was really brilliant because every day on set was like a new challenge. So she would either be the wallflower at the balls or she'd be, you know, this businesswoman sorting out her deals or she'd be a bready teenager with her mom or this love struck puppy with Colin yeah every day felt like a new thing it's just she's such a fun character to play so fun and so fun to watch through all the scenes as well like because she's she's just got all the secrets and she's kind of juggling all of them internally which I I love I thought that's so fascinating um what was your like most sort of favorite scene or, or sequence to to play out in this season one of my favourites is actually in the first episode and it's a scene with Eloise played by Claudia Jesse mm-hmm. and it was written by Jess Brownell who's our new showrunner coming in for, for season three mm-hmm. and it was just this beautiful moment of female friendship and I feel like like the girls were saying that's something this show does really well explore the relationships between women and it's a time when you know the two girls they're very young and very naive but they sort of present themselves to one another in a really beautiful way you know Penelope talks about how she she sort of likes that no one notices her and she's sort of figuring it out as she says it Mm. and it's she's someone who's so used to you know hiding under layers of secrets that that's sort of a rare moment even though she's not being completely transparent she's allowing you know Eloise to see her in a certain way I think yeah just like it's a show that it's it's so fun and there's so much pomp and ceremony around it but the writing in scenes like that is so beautiful as an actor when you get those scenes you really relish them. Mm -hmm. I really, really love the female relationships explored and, and so central to the whole show. I think, you know, uh, watching this with my sister and us seeing sort of similarities in in Edwina and Kate or just even the friendships um, felt really... And it's funny because obviously period dramas do tend to have a lot of, you know, female-centered, but it tends to be also very centered on love stories, which of course Bridgerton is, but we really get to explore really complex, interesting female relationships here. And, and I thought that was really wonderful. I wanted to ask for Charita and Simone, you know, Edwina and Kate go through such a journey together here. Yeah. Uh, we very much see, you know, um, Kate being so protective of her sister and very kind of almost having to become like almost the, the matriarch of the family um and then by the end we were seeing these roles sort of reversing and loosening so I just wanted to talk, uh, ask you both about that journey how you both interpreted it and how you just chose to play it in key moments throughout yeah um <laughs> whoever wants to go first oh okay I'll, I'll go first I am um, I think what I loved about the relationship between Kate and Anita, Edwina um I think it's it's very clear to see the shift in dynamic between them, Kate being the protector and the elder sibling and guiding Edwina through this massacre of a ton into the, ma- the marriage market. But what's so special about Edwina is, and Charitha's amazing performance that delivers this arc within her where she really comes into her own. And actually Edwina is the one that is conveying lessons and teaches Kate and really puts her in her place. Because what I loved about Kate was, yes, she's strong and fierce and she's protecting her family and the stakes are much higher for this family and it's an act of survival, which is Mm. one I think many people can relate to. But she is flawed because she's torn between her duty and her heart and it makes her quite dishonest with her family and being dishonest with herself. And it takes her sister Edwina to reveal that and to just simply say to her, like, you're not being honest with me or with us and with yourself collectively. And you see such a shift in their relationship. And by the end of it, it, it's completely different the way that they are with each other. Mm -hmm. In episode eight, when they have that final scene of reconciliation between each other, I think there's a line, I can't remember it, but Edwina's like, I, I feel like I never really knew you. Mm. Um, and I, there's something so special about that because I, I think um, Kate was really holding up this um, almost surface level narrative of I'm doing this to protect my sister, but almost dehumanizing her in a way, not in any way of animosity, but just right. obli- obliviously. Um, Cause I guess she was so pressurized by all these responsibilities and it, and it took Edwina to grow into her own and use her voice and say, 
what mm-hmm. she what she wanted. Um, and I loved seeing that for Edwina, um, particularly to see a woman mm-hmm. really come into her own and em- empower herself and say things like, I'm not a little girl anymore. Like, this is what mm-hmm. I want. Um, and so I loved that relationship between them. Um, I think it's one that many people can relate to. And there's so many moments of intimacy between them um, and vulnerability and also a, a lot of um, conflict between them yeah. where they're almost left speechless, Kate for one especially, um, which I think is what makes this season much more complicated um, and it get more, more grittier in that sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I totally think that Simone hit the nail on the head when she says that all of these women, not only Edwina and Kate, are surviving. They're doing what they need to do to survive in this really intense sometimes cruel environment Mm. and I think that when people are trying to survive like that you're invariably going to get conflicts that arise and I think what's so special about the portrayal of female relationships on the show is that they're very real Mm -hmm. female relationships are beautiful but they're also messy it's not happy all the time and actually a sign of intimacy I think is conflict and you see that with Kate and Edwina you see that with um Pan and Eloise, you see that with Mm. Queen and Lady Danbury. And so it's actually how do these brilliant women overcome these conflicts and get to a better place with each other? Um, And I think it's just very, and I think that's what's really different about Bridgerton as opposed to previous period dramas where we didn't actually, they didn't actually dig into sort of the grittiness and the messiness of womanhood and female relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful that we all get to participate in a show that does that yeah absolutely yeah. well Nicola I also think I always kept thinking like it, Penelope and Kate would probably have very interesting conversations together because mm-hmm. I feel like they're both kind of shouldering almost similar burdens with regards to their family and you know the the duties they feel and you know their place in society you know Mm um I found them actually maneuvering almost in very similar spaces um so I was actually curious I wanted to ask each of you like which character in the Bridgerton universe do you feel like your character would maybe have had a very good friendship with that we maybe haven't seen play out in a way yet I, I I know I really wanted us to have a scene together and it just this it's such a big world and I think yeah. our stories very much ran sort of alongside one another but didn't cut in but I'm quite excited you know that we know we're coming back for season three we're very yeah. privileged in that respect to have been commissioned for four which is amazing but I'm I really hope that we have some of that in the next season because yeah I do think they have a lot of similarity there and it's something within Julia Quinn's books is they do strike up a friendship and I think there's like a mutual respect between those two women I did have a really sweet scene with you Teresa actually which I really enjoyed yeah. I was like I wonder if they're gonna get to chat more but yeah it's such a it's such a big world with so many things happening also like I've never like I've never spoken to Benedict not like not one time <laughs> I think and it's weird I didn't even think about that but that's true <laughs> no I know and I love Luke Thompson and I was like I wish we'd have a scene together and then I was like but also what would they talk about I don't know <laughs> I think all the women in this show and this world can relate to one another in some yeah. way. And what's so beautiful about it is, like Tarithwa was saying, is overcoming that conflict and that archaic kind of narrative we see in previous period dramas and what happens when you push mm-hmm. past that. And it, it really, it, it simmers and you find, in, you know, you're not so different from one another at all, especially within that kind of society where everyone's watching, there's so much rules and restrictions as a woman and so much expectation. And each of these women and these these female characters in the show want, I think it's um, Eloise, um, she says, well, what if I want to fly? And I think every single woman in, in yeah. this world of Bridgerton is like, yeah, me too. Yeah, I want to fly too. Yeah. But they all get there in their own way. And they do. Ed- Edwina comes to her own and flies in her own way. Kate gets her love, um, and Penelope. I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens. She's she's still, <laughs> yes. still gliding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she has stories to be told. Um, uh, one thing I really sort of also love about this season, and I'd love to ask you guys about it, is the slow burn, which 
I think with season one, Bridgerton, you know, um, the steaminess was a big part of the appeal and loved that. I love watching um, the the central couple be very involved in that. But I kind of love that this went back to the roots of period drama and let it stew all the way until the end of se- like episode six, I think. We had to wait <laughs> so long to even get that first moment between Kate and Anthony um and I'm just curious to know like what what you think that added or made different about this season and how all all three of you perhaps even were involved in playing that slow burnout (laughs) I I mean I I loved it in the sense it, it was so earned those moments end of episode six seven and eight um and I think what happened was we were able to really indulge in our characters' journeys and the audience then feel the same way. You're rooting for these characters and their development mm. and their journey throughout the story. And it wasn't a performative thing, um, like, oh, we're just going to throw in an intimate scene here or a bit of romance there. It was so authentic and truthful to the time that these characters had so much pressure on them Um and that, and that is the truth of this world and that society. Mm. Um, and they both truly have priorities of putting their family first. And Anthony comes from quite a privileged background of wealth, but beneath all of that, it, it, the heart of it is he wants to be there for his family and do right by his family. And it's the same for Kate and Edwina. The stakes are much higher for them and it is a, an act of survival. But beneath mm-hmm. that, they, they they do want love, they do want freedom, and they deserve that as well. Um, so I think it, it it was really scratching beneath the surface through each episode and all the different pivots. Um, and I loved the tension that we created between them um, and, and the love triangle um, with Edwina suppressing, like her finding out the truth and then that all being revealed. Um, I think that was just the juiciest bit of it all really. Um, I always think of Bridgerton, like in my head, it's like a limit, like an anthology series. Mm-hmm. In every season is very distinct and could stand on its own. Um, and what we say about Bridgerton is it's, it's, uh, it's a show about love, not only romantic love, but love between all different types of relationships. And within that, every couple, romantic couple has a different love story and they have their different battles. So for the specific characters of Daphne and Simon, this, the intimate season, season one, totally made sense. But um, Kate and Anthony are very different characters and their struggles were more sort of psychologically undressing, as one would say. So the slow burn in season two, I think is just totally true to mm-hmm what is to their story it just makes sense and i'm sure season three season four will also be very different to season one and two in this respect because it's not about a formula and just going this 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 is what we need for success it's actually these are the characters and what's right for these characters and i think that's true of all of our plots and like narratives within the show yeah Mm mm-hmm one of the, well, one of the biggest things that I didn't know was that, you know, romance as a genre has such specific set of tropes. So, you know, I guess season one is the sort of fake dating trope and season two is enemies to lovers. And there's like loads more to explore. So it's yeah, I never read a romance book prior to reading any of Bridgerton, but they're really specific things that, you know, fans of that genre really recognize. So it's going to be a different trope every year that's through. And yeah, as the girl said, repeating season one wouldn't have really (laughs) made any sense. So uh, yeah, again, season three is going to be different and season four will be different again. It's like a maze each season. As you said, that it's all about different tropes of love. And these characters, they they understand what they're feeling for one another from the get-go, right from the moment they meet. But it's that maze of how do they get there? Because look, mm-hmm. if, if love's like the conclusion of it all, that's it's the same throughout every story, but how they get there, I think is exactly what Nicola was saying. It's a different trope every single time. I, that totally makes sense. And I'm, I'm excited to see, uh, I also don't, I, I didn't, I'm not so familiar with the romance genre, but certainly Bridgerton is 
getting me interested <laughs> for sure and I love seeing these tropes play out uh, and just learning more about the genre itself and its fandoms um, and it seems like it, Bridgerton itself just has such a, an incredible fandom uh, one thing that's really sort of stuck with me uh, being South Asian growing up in England as you can imagine I know the two of you have spoken about this Simone and Angelita we didn't see ourselves in in these incredible dramas that we loved by the way our parents love watching them you know they're kind of we love watching them and and I love yeah I studied English literature because I love them so much and yet for some reason we were never part of the narrative what I love so much about Bridgerton is that it's it's not colorblind casting it's color conscious right it's very much making sure that each character is uh their background their their heritage is respected in their storyline i'd just love to like ask ask you guys about that you know why bridgerton how bridgerton's been able to do this and why it's so important for the sort of genre period dramas going forward to reflect worlds that look like this (laughs) well i always say that i think firstly on the most superficial level it's just more exciting i think it's <laughs> more fun visually to see so many different people on screen and i think audiences deserve to be seen as well right like you're going to be more invested when you can relate to yourself visually and physically and what i'm so proud of with bridgerton is i think that it's opened up a genre to people of color that perhaps they didn't think was accessible Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's it's so special and I I know that Shelley Conn who plays our wonderful mother on the show when she was leaving drama school she was sort of implicitly told oh you'll probably never be in it you'll never be in a period drama and so like growing up wanting to be an actor I I just never thought it was a possibility for me until a show like Bridgerton mm-hmm. so um, yeah I think it's just it just makes more for a more exciting story. And I think that when it's color conscious and our race and our experiences are part of our characters and reflect our storylines, it makes for more interesting conversations. Um, and, you know, I, I think what's so special about Bridgerton is that it's not done for a specific audience. For example, right. use of Kabikushi Kabikam at the beginning of episode yeah. six, right? Like, non desi audiences are not going to know that Easter egg. <laughs> it's something that is done for our community, and I'm so proud yeah. that we could do that. Um, so, yeah, just, just, it's very special, and I hope people feel seen, finally. It's very powerful what's happened, um, and I think it was one thing filming it, and I remember I would look at the monitors every so often and see... Charithra and myself and it was I couldn't really put it into words it just felt so amazing to be in the costumes in these settings Mm -hmm. playing this kind of love story and as Charithra said uh, years ago I never thought that I would even be filling the shoes of characters like that Um, and it was a ripple effect of Chris Van Dusen's choices and the writer's room and it, it's such an important message of how powerful having diversity behind the cameras affects what happens in front of the cameras. Um, and yeah, I think we've, we've received such a warm response from the South Asian community, from women of all different heritages, um, where they feel seen. And it's mm-hmm. so empowering and people have such a smile on their face and they feel lifted and recognized. And that's why we do this. We're, we are in the entertainment industry. And yeah. it, as Truth was said, it's, it's supposed to be fun and uplifting, but we are, we are doing this for the people and it's what the people want to see. And I, I, I only hope um, after this season, moving forward, um, it's not just a, a one-off that we see right. this happening and it's a rhythm and a heartbeat that continues to break barriers throughout the industry and many different love stories. Um, and seeing women um, like Charitha and I having characters where their heritages are celebrated and acknowledged, and also for audiences, no matter who you are, to relate to and Mm -hmm. recognize their feeling, their feeling of fear, of love, of struggle, of pressure. Um, Yeah, it it was such a powerful moment and likewise, just super proud, really proud to have just been a part of it and to have worked with Charitha as well. 
I I've never worked with another Tamil actress before. Mm -hmm. um, so it was such an amazing experience and I learned so much from her um, so much about my own heritage. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it, 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 hopefully it just continues to be normalized more. I agree. I think we need that. Finally, it's so great to see it. I have to say when I went to the Bridgerton Ball, even seeing so <laughs> many South Asian girls just like dressed up to the nines and feeling included. I've never seen them before in these kinds of rooms and just seeing them feel so accepted and dancing and twirling and just having the best time made me so happy. I was like, wow, it's, it's taken us a while to get here, but how beautiful is it that we are now here? One yeah. thing I did want to ask a little bit about the Sharmas, which I think some of us have been, I, I would love to know a little bit more about their, their background specifically, um, you know, because I feel like there are different uh, Indian regions reflected, you know, in, in, whether they, they're speaking and certain, they're using certain words or, you know, um, like, I feel like maybe Simone, uh, your character calling uh, Edwina bo Bon mm -hmm. is like a version of the Bengali Bon, but we weren't sure. So we just wanted to ask kind of, you know, what the, the sort of different makeup was for the Sharma sisters. Sure. I mean, I mean, like we said earlier, I think the Sharmas coming from India Mm -hmm. um and they they came with like the last pennies in their in their pockets and the stakes were so much higher for them it truly was an act of survival for Kate to make sure her sister was supported mm -hmm. and found true love and married into a family that could protect her and also for her mother as well and I think that's the one thing that made them very unique amongst this Tom that kind of pressure and priority and um, act of survival that these this family experienced that no no other family I think could um, relate to in that sense um, and I think you know we Charitha and I worked really closely with um, Jane Karen our amazing accent coach um, mm -hmm. and I remember before we started filming we would sit with our iPhones and have like voice recordings playing with different um, levels of the accent or the styles of it um, yeah. and I I'm so happy that we did that because I think there was a moment where we weren't sure whether we were going to bring an accent to these characters. Right. And, um, and then from that to have moments like Dee Dee and Bon um, referenced into it um, and to, to get such a reception from the people watching it, recognizing these words, relating to them, having that sense of nostalgia. Um, I think it was brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so proud to have been a part of that. Yeah. No, I totally agree with everything Simone said. And in relation to like the background history of the Sharmas, I think, at least this is how I perceived it. I wouldn't want to speak on anyone else's behalf, but I think what we want, we recognize it was so revolutionary. There hadn't been, you know, two dark skinned Indian leads mm -hmm. in like Bridgeton before. So I think there was this kind of element of, we wanted to represent India as a whole mm -hmm. and India has so many specific languages and cultures and heritages and saying Appa, which is South Indian and yeah. the, the, which is Hindi and born, which is, you know, Bengali. I think we wanted like as much of India to be reflected as possible. So I think we almost wanted to make it sort of like pan Indian, which was yeah. incorporating different aspects of the culture so that all Indians could see themselves in these characters. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, the show had a consultant hired, um, this wonderful woman um, who uh, was sort of very knowledgeable in the history of India in that in the Regency period. And mm -hmm. actually, you know, there was a community of um, South Asians traveling from India to London back then. I mean, in like London in 1814, there were tens of thousands of brown people. Of course, they weren't part of the Tom, but so that migration did happen. And um, so it was really wonderful to work with an academic who did know the history, who could give us a bit of a background. Um, and again, as Simone said, we got to work with an accent coach. So we it was a conscious decision to kind of make the Sharma accent be something of a middle ground between English RP, which is sort of the Queen's English, and a more sort of um, heavy Indian accent. Because right. the idea was that these women have entered into a world where they're putting on a show. Right. So, you know, they're Indians who grew up in India, but they're trying to put on an English accent almost. 
Mm-hmm. So that's, that makes sense. The, that's how that evolved. But yeah, we, we wanted to reflect all of India as opposed to one specific yeah. region, which is why you have the mix of the words and cultures. That makes sense. And I kind of, I love, like you said, I think a lot of us just loved it, seeing little snippets of, you know, specific things from our backgrounds and broader things uh, reflected, which was really, really fun. Um, Nicola, for you, I would love to ask you a little bit more about, um, obviously, as you're coming back to this, the costumes and the, and the settings have just, it feels like they they were even more enhanced from like the first season onwards it's it's like popping even more it's so vibrant it's so beautiful um what was the sort of biggest kind of at least in terms of costume what were the biggest sort of changes for your character in the costumes and how they were used to kind of show her trajectory um as she sort of you know her reveal is shown and she's kind of navigating the lady whistle down of it all in this season well, it was really fun this season because you still, you know, keep her within that Featherington colour palette. I mean, the show, it, it's quite fun coming into a second series, not having to sort of explain it because mm-hmm. Bridgerton has almost become its own genre now in which people know, you know, it is anachronistic. It's super colourful. It's super diverse. All those things are now accepted. So now we can have that as the groundwork and then really play. And, you know, the Featheringtons, as I said, were super over the top, all this colour, but, you know it makes me it's amazing you basically learn so much within a fitting about how much a little like taking in of a costume here could totally change a line of a dress and you know imply someone's status or their age or a million different things or you know when you know Prudence Featherington is trying to get a husband and they're you know re-altering her dresses and all of this stuff so they very much stayed within that color palette of the yellows and pinks but the, the structure of the dresses was sort of more flattering. It was a bit more grown up. And it was really fun to play her growing up in real time during it. Mm-hmm. You know, come in thinking, you know, she's had a lot happen to her since season one and that she's lost her father. She's had, you know, this sort of fallout with her cousin. And she comes back and she kind of thinks she's a grown woman, but she's not. I always say to people, it's her Britney Spears season because she's not a girl, <laughs> not yet a woman. She, she thinks she's got it all figured out and she very much doesn't. So it's exciting there to be in prep for season three and see where they're taking her now. But it's really fun to see, you know, the costumes from the very beginning. Teresa and I got to go to the Bridgeton experience last night and see some of the costumes displayed. Yeah, uh, it was amazing. But yeah, it's it's just, it's such a privilege to wear things that are, you know, I, I think the costume department, Sophie Canale, who designed in season two, she did such a phenomenal job so phenomenal and people don't realize that even the costumes that the supporting artists wear are completely custom and made from scratch wow. they're really amazing yeah it, I mean I think in that care and detail sh- comes across on screen you know to us as well it's just it's such an exquisite looking show uh, which to me I just I love that about any show when when you see incredible production on screen as well and it's all just shining through you're so immersed in the world and it's such a beautiful escape um I'm curious for each of you, what's been the most surprising thing that you've learned about life in that time period? Uh, something you didn't know at all, had to maybe incorporate into your own characters. But yeah, what, what sort of uh, surprised you? I think I, I was less surprised and more, it was such a challenge because there were so many rules about what a lady was allowed to do and what they weren't mm-hmm. allowed to do. And one of those things were was being tactile, especially with a man. Um, So in Kate's scenes with Anthony, particularly when they were arguing or things were heated, there's so much chemistry bubbling away between them. Um, It was such a challenge as an actress to to understand how can I convey an emotion without grabbing him, without touching him, without putting my arms around him. Um, And I think that's something that we see throughout the whole series, that suppressed feeling. Um, where both Kate and Anthony are so trapped within these rules of this society that they can't just let their wings spread and and liberate themselves to just be in love with one another. Um, so I think that's, it, it surprised me kind of, I kind of, I, I knew of this rule that women, you know, they had to be a lady. They weren't allowed to cross their legs too much. They weren't allowed to touch a man. Um, they weren't allowed to say certain things. Uh, in episode two in the races, for example, um, when placing a bet on the horses, Kate had to actually check if Lady Danbury was watching or not because without her chaperone's approval, she wasn't allowed to put her own money to bet on a horse 
all of wow. these different restrictions and rules that just seem completely alien to us now in modern <laughs> day. Um, and I, I think obviously we're in this show, we are portraying really strong, independent and smart women that are, that are so mm -hmm. self-realized and know what they want, but with that mm -hmm. challenge of a restrictive society, how do we get there? How do they express themselves? Um, and you can see that with all the female characters in the show, um, they don't give up and they don't surrender to what society is expecting of them. They keep fighting onwards. And I think that's the audience cheer them on at the same time. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Nicola, Chirico, do you have anything that surprised you? Mm, mine's kind of almost the opposite because I think I presume that like Regency England was like very, very conservative. And in many ways it obviously is, as Simone's described, but it's also like you look at um, uh, Madame Delacroix, right? And she's running mm -hmm. a business and she has employees and same with Lady Whistledown. And like the women are drinking and gambling and smoking. And um, so that really surprised me. Actually, like these ladies can get down and they can party and <laughs> I'm uh, uh, so that was a real surprise, like in the ball scenes where, you know, uh, our directors would be like, do you want to drink a glass of champagne? And I'm like, OK, I will. I'll, I'll do that in this scene. So, yeah, that I, I didn't expect um, in almost the opposite way. I think I overestimated how conservative that society was. So I didn't expect some of the freedoms that they did have. And I think one of the biggest things yeah, one of the biggest things I found was the level of ignorance that they kept women in is like quite upsetting, you know, that they weren't, they didn't know what sex was. And Claudia and I joked about it a lot and we were like, they really, they don't know. They have no clue and they have no way of like finding this out. And the fact that a woman was kept in the dark about that until her wedding night was really shocking, you know? Yeah. And it's not just about like all the things that we, you know, know that they, you know, weren't allowed to sort of go to school and all of this stuff. But that I'm like, God, you really, you know, kept them like children in a lot of ways until they then had to be a grown up immediately. It was such it's such a bizarre thing. Yeah, no, that's it's it's fascinating to watch that time period play out. But I can imagine like when you're the actors who are actually having to portray women in in that in those roles, uh, it must be very interesting because you're weaving it into your entire performance and being conscious of it all the time. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you before we have to let you go is let's talk about Jonathan Bailey for a moment <laughs> uh, obviously we see Anthony you know really step into center stage here I've got to say wasn't his biggest fan in season one I don't think a lot of us were uh, <laughs> but you know things changed in season two um, and I just you know for truth and uh, something you had to you know both play out relationships with his character um, in different ways um, and I would love to know more about just the process for each of you with him and what he brought to this season that you felt was, you know, uh, Nicola, you, you might be able to talk to this about what you felt he was able to do differently in this season that uh, compared to the first season. What was so amazing about Kate and Anthony's relationship is how so aligned they were in within each other's lives before they met mm -hmm. and the first scene that you see in episode one that moment of right time right place when they're riding on their horses they are both um riding alone at dawn as like a form of escapism and then they meet and the sun's rising and they're smiling and it goes from this place of like a dark lonely um feeling to that spark of hope and What's so amazing that Johnny did with with Anthony, he's he Anthony's a man that's under so much pressure, um, but and is so misunderstood in that way, and is very used to people um, giving up on him, walking away, or maybe not seeing what's happening beneath the surface, and acknowledging like his past trauma as well, which Johnny portrayed so excellently at the end of episode three when when in the B scene, and I think um, when approaching our characters together what was so interesting is for a man like the viscount who you know is quite the rake in the ton all the ladies want him i mean jo johnny portrays anthony in such a charming way um I, I had to think about what did it take um to play the woman 
that sees beneath that. And if Anthony's like fire, Kate's like water, and she she controls her emotions, she has a sense of maturity. She has the same um, values and priorities for family and life that Anthony has um, beneath all the wealth and the privilege mm. that he has. Um, and I think um, what Johnny portrayed so excellently is the fact that he never gave up on Kate, no matter what happened um, within the Sharma family and him up to the wedding. Um, he he brought such a, a faith to a character that had every right to have given up on the thought of love. And I think he, he did such a brilliant job serving that. Um, a man that, as you were saying, may have mis been misunderstood in season one, um, really capture our hearts and show that he he does deserve happiness, he does deserve love, he does deserve understanding. Um, yeah, and I, I think his fights that he he gave to Anthony really affected all of us, all of our different characters, because mm. he didn't give up on us, and likewise, we didn't want to give up on on Anthony. Yeah. It was really nice to see him come come into his own in this yeah. season. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree with everything Simone said. And I think what really amazed me about Johnny is that, you know, as you said, he was an incredibly polarizing character in season one, but Johnny always had that clarity of who Anthony is. Like there was never a moment of doubt in Johnny's mind about the kind of man Anthony was that we all saw in season two. Um, and that like taught me so much as an actor. And I think that what's so brilliant about Johnny is he's such a generous like uh, scene partner. He gives you so much to work with um, and it, the, that makes the job so much easier. And I think as specifically approaching Edwina and Anthony's relationship, I think that it was that fi finding that fine balance of a relationship that is, the power dynamic is clearly very off and yet, there is parity on certain things that these people sort of align in certain ways but they're clearly misaligned in others and finding mm. that balance of okay this could possibly work but it's clearly not meant to be mm. um and it was it was a real challenge and i, I I'm, I'm so happy that i had the opportunity to work with them well, Nicola, I think you were the one who is... saw oh sorry <laughs> oh no no you're fine sorry, <laughs> I was say. No, I was saying you're the one who got to see him grow, you know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. What, yeah what's the biggest I think what I've always really, I think Jonathan Bailey is an unbelievable actor. I think I was a fan of him way before working with him. Um, he's really committed and really deeply cares about what he's doing. Um, but he, a thing I really respect about him specifically is that he's not afraid to play the character's unlikable parts because as an actor, you can't, be worried about you can't need the audience to like you all the time and I think in this show each of our characters actually are pushed to do unlikable things mm -hmm. that make the audience kind of go oh but if you try and hold back and if you try and go but I still want to be liked it compromises the narrative so you have to sort of be selfless in that way and I feel like that's something that he exhibits so so well absolutely uh, but the three of you are so incredible to watch in this season and I absolutely fell in love with all of your characters I have to I'm I'm, I'm just a really big stand for Penelope though just because I she has such an interesting story so I'm really excited to see how that all plays out <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's really exciting. I know, I know. I haven't seen the script yet, but I know the general layout for for season three, and I'm very excited. I am hoping for for scenes with Kate, and I am hoping Trita returns with a really hot a hot other half. I feel like that would be a really satisfying thing. <laughs> Same, yeah, definitely. Give me a hot significant other. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm rooting for it it's very strongly. I think she deserves it. She definitely I think she does. deserves Aww. it. Well, um, Teresa, Simone, Nicola, thank you so much. On behalf of the SAG After Foundation, I just want to thank you so much for sharing your experiences, your process, and your craft with fellow performers. And uh, everybody, go watch Bridgerton season two if you haven't already. Aww. <laughs>